All right, uh, dear students. Um, well, today, well, this, this is still about EIEs, and now we want to really start with numerical approximation. And but before we really start with that, um, I want to make a regression on that, and start with numerical approximation of ordinary differential equations. Oh, because the, like, the methods are more or less the same, the ideas how to analyze them is the same. So I think it should be good if everyone of you knows how to really approximate ordinary differential equations. And um, today we will learn about schemes, basically so-called one-step methods. And most notably these very famous Runge Kutta methods. Um, and then they will really generally how to approximate. So what is the idea and, and the principle behind it and how how, how to analyze Um, and here what will be important, convergence, stability, and consistency. All right, that's, that's, that's the setting for today. And well, let's start with this um, general idea. What, what, what does it mean to numerically approximate an ODE and more accurately we will want to approximate the solution of an ODE. So we will assume that here this is the ODE that well, we will always consider, think of, of this ODE being in the background, given as x dot of t as f of t and x of t, and it has an initial value. And now if we want to draw this here in, in this chart, um, here's t0, then it has his, its initial value, here there is x0, and then, well, this, this will be a, a smooth trajectory like this. So we assume that this is the solution, x. Okay, and now we typically we cannot um, <laughs> even draw the solution so easily because we don't know it, unless this is a very simple form on the map, what we might have solution formulas, but generally we don't have solution formulas. And then we will help ourselves with trying to approximate the solution with the help of, of a computer and, and, and a smart algorithm. Um, and approximation has actually two components. One thing is the, a time grid. So we cannot have the solution everywhere for t, but only at some points, say at t0, at t1, at t2 and at t3 and so on. So this is, is the time grid and the, these are the points where we want will approximate the solution um, by, by a value that is as close as possible to the solution. If we, uh, if we would need it at other values, um, well then either we have to change our time grid or well, one can make them think of interpolating between say t1 and t2. Okay, and then for these discrete time instances, we will look for discrete approximations. Um, at t, e t equal to t0, um, we, we have it already. So here we know the solution because it's the initial value. So th this is given. And then at t1, well, we want to compute a value that well, certainly takes this information of this x0, so where we started. And then what we also know is this, this f. The right hand side. So we certainly will use this the ODE or what we know of the ODE, namely how this f um, is, um, well, how to evaluate this um, to maybe have an approximation to, to that value. And then now we know this value and then we go on and now compute another approximation here, taking into account the values that we know already and of course well, the, the ODE. Well, and then we will like compute a sequence. And if we use a good scheme for that, then we can think that these values, they will approximate the actual 
solution at that time. Um, that's the idea. Um, here I have written down a very general scheme for, for such um, approximation. And we may think of, well, um, the new value, so x, xi plus 1. So this was x0, this here will be x1. This here, this value will be x2. So the, the new value will depend on the, on the method. So this, this phi denotes the method that we use. Um, it will depend on the time. Here in the right hand side, there is the time involved. So if we, will, uh, if we use the ODE, then we will use also, also use the time and the time we know. So yeah, we know this time and we know this time. Um, on the previous value, so we will use this value to compute this one and then we will use this value to compute that one. And well, I have included this here, also the new value possibly because uh, often these terms are, these methods are implicit. So we will not have an explicit relation like xi plus 1 is something right hand side, although there are explicit schemes. So this can also be explicit and then then this xi plus 1 is not, not to be seen here, but particularly for DIEs we will have to use implicit schemes. And uh, but yeah, so think if like the, the method ended would end with the xi, then this would be an explicit method. And well, if the method, the function for the method includes the xi plus one, then we speak of implicit methods. Um, so we will talk about single step methods. That's why we have only the xi here. Um, well, we can also think of MSM multi-step methods. Multi-step methods that we will have things like the xi plus one will be some some method okay the h i haven't explained yet gi xi minus one xi xi plus one so here there is more than just one step involved one previous step but maybe more and um, well we will talk about multi-step methods in particular but it's just to tell you that we can take more than just the xi here and there's still methods for that. Oh, I have forgot to explain what is the h. The h is the, is the step size. So here's the difference between t0 and t1. This is the h. And we will assume that when between all these ti's there is a constant step size. So they all have the same difference and so on. But uh, I will also make one little comment that it's not typically you won't use an explicit uh, uh, uniform step size but for all the theory it's it's much con more convenient to to think of this as a constant okay um some notation so this these xi this will be the approximation to to act the actual solution at x of ti so xi is approximation and this is the actual solution at ti. H is the step size. Like how far are these time instances apart? And we will assume, assume equidistant, that's the term for that, equidistant steps. Meaning from T0 to T1, it's the same distance as from T1 to T2. And phi h is the method. Uh, and I think in English might be increment function, in German it's Verfahrensfunktion, but um, what well, this ph this describes the method that we use. And I we will start with an example that, that shows you what, what this actually means. Take another color. So implicit Euler, Euler scheme, what this will look like. So we are still in this um, x dot. Well, we have x dot at ti is f of ti 
x of ti. Well, um, that's that's just the ODE. That's what what the ODE gives us. And what the implicit Euler scheme does is um, I write it down and then then we can discuss it. X i plus i plus i and a over h is f of t i x. Okay, never mind. T i plus one x i plus one. Okay, or and this is obviously the same as xi plus 1 is xi plus f plus h times, so we multiply with h, h times phi uh, f ti plus 1 xi plus 1. Okay, what we actually did was replacing this, this, um, this differential with the dif difference quotient. And well, this somehow seems to make a lot of sense. Um, if we start with one, then we can put here the x zero, and then we get uh, this gives us that something that's very consistent with with the actual ODE. And there will be another explanation why why this makes so much sense. You can also try to interpret this graphically. Um, no, this I won't, don't want to add right now. Um, okay, and. Well, all what is in here then, this defines the, this phi, there's this h, here you see the ti, actually it's ti plus one, but um, wait a second, you see the xi, you see the xi plus one. Okay, so here's the xi, here's the xi plus one, here is this h. You don't see the ti yet, uh, ti plus one, there's only the ti, but because it depends on h and uh, because the function already knows the h, it can compute the ti plus one from ti plus h. Okay, note that ti plus one is ti plus h. So this this um is this implicit Euler scheme in this general form. X one plus one xi plus one is fh of ti, xi and xi plus one. And for the analysis, if we now want to analyze these schemes, chapter here. If we want to analyze the schemes, the terms that we need is consistency, stability, and there, there's this, this famous, well, that, that's the one thing you should remember about these methods is if the method is consistent and if it is stable, then it is convergence. Um, let me start with telling you what is convergence. Convergence means that x of n minus x of x at tn and the norm goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And we have to understand this, um, well, in this way. So here we will have the tn, here we have the t0, here this is the actual function, the actual x, um, here we have the x0, here we have the x1, and here we maybe have the xn. Let's say this is the approximation. And now, <laughs> as I put it the wrong way, but we better say as h goes to zero. Meaning, so like this was the initial h, and then the h gets smaller. So we make more steps actually to get here at tn. And well, 
but when if the steps get arbitrarily small, then the solution will tend to to the actual solution. Stability. Oh no, let's start with what does consistency mean. Um, I like to say that the scheme um, does what it should. So, for example, it really approximates this this um this different this diff uh, different the, the first derivative of the scheme and well he has read it right hand side, but we will um there will be a definition for consistency coming up. But you can think of, well, we have designed it <laughs> in the right way. And stability is um, the scheme works in practice. So there's more things to that. Here the scheme does what it should, so it's, it's designed properly. Um, well, if everything was perfect, then, then it will work well. But in practice, not everything is perfect. That's why one needs stability too. But if both is, is there, like the scheme is designed properly and it's stable, then, then this convergence will happen. Um, for um, consistency, there is a real, uh, really useful definition. Um, consistency, we say phi h is of consistency order p plus 1 if the local consistency error which is defined as x of t i plus 1 minus phi h of t i plus 1 x of t i plus 1 x of t i. So if this error um, I will comment on this in a second. Um, if this is um, uh, behaves like um, okay, is here this O notation as of H P plus one. And you can think this that this is this error is basically a constant times h p plus one. This is this O notation meaning um, this error goes to faster to zero than h um, in the power p plus one. So we can bound this by this. And uh, what does this consistency error mean? This is um, putting the like here's the real the the actual solution. So this is putting the actual solution into the scheme. And this is what I mean, it, the scheme does what it should. So if we like are in the perfect world, we do the, we already know what, what, what are the values and we put them into the scheme, then we get a really small error that depends on this h and also means this h goes to zero, then this error goes to zero very, very slowly. And yeah, and maybe the general way of proof Prove by Taylor. So, example the implicit Euler scheme. There we have that x of t i plus one. Uh, my so this was. Let's go back to the implicit Euler. X i plus one. My this was phi i to. Uh, phi h to of t i and so on. So we put here the real value and here also the the actual values. So x i minus x of t i minus 
H times F. Let's let let's ignore the T for example. Let's we f of x of t t i plus one. Okay, that that's the actual error. So this is the the h is this one. That that's the consistency error. Um, if we use Taylor, then we have here that this is x of i plus x dot plus 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 um do you all recall Taylor series so yeah, that's, a, that's a good idea so the function r of t plus h is r of t plus h r dot of t plus half h square a second dot of t and so on so this is taylor expansion we do this here so this um this here is actually t i plus h so this will be x of t i plus h times x dot of t h plus one half h squared uh, uh, the, the second dot the second dot of of the x plus one over six h to the three the third and so on so this is this very first part here is this part this all becomes this part and minus x of ti so this was this part here minus x of ti and then we have this here minus h times f of now here we have again x t i plus one and this is as we had it in here plus x of t i plus h x dot x of t i plus and so on um this is the same as so we already see that this one cancels and this one cancels here we have h x dot of this will be h times x dot was the same as the f of x so x dot is the same as the f of the x so this is h times f at x of t i plus one half h squared x double dot plus and so on now we have to do something here about this h and here we now do a taylor expansion of f at at the point at the point x t i and the increment is this one here so here we will start with take a particular color for that so now we are here in this part. Here we got minus h f of x of t i. This is like the, the first part of the, of the Taylor. 
Oh, this is this part, namely the first, like this R of T, as we had it here. So this is particularly this part. And then the first here we will have minus H times H F no. So this is the part H R dot. Well, this will be f differentiated with respect to x, so f at x of ti, but then we have to do um, the inner derivative too. Okay, and well, never mind. So, so on. this is how it works, and now we also see that. Here, these parts they 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 also cancel each other. Here, this this part is cancelled with this part, and what stays is one part that has an h square in it, and another part that has an h square in it, and a lot of other parts that have that are so-called higher order terms, higher order terms. And so here is something h square times a constant plus h3 times a constant and maybe so on. And this is obviously order of h squared. And here you see the order. So here we have the two. This was the, the error. It has order two, so this implicit Euler scheme is consistent of order one. Uh, no, it's somehow. So it's consistent of order one well, because the local consistency error is quadratic. And it's a consistent scheme that is consistent with order one. Well, and stability, no, I don't want to get into this anymore. This means um, rounding errors. Oh, forget about it. So stability means um, stability. <laughs> Stability means the scheme works in practice. So there might be rounding's error that accumulate, and stability tells us that the accumulation is not that bad. All right, and so this is how one can approximate ODEs. And then I must say, okay, maybe one more, one more illustration. What does the implicit Euler scheme actually does is so let's say this is the actual solution. Um, what is this? Say here is t0, here is t1. This is the x0. And then what the implicit Euler scheme actually does is Explicit Euler is easier to explain. Explicit Euler is um, xi plus 1, x, xi plus hf, ti, xi. The difference here is only that here we have like the, the new step at a new value, and but we can also just use the old value in here. And what it does, it takes the x0 step, so this is the x0 here, um, evaluates the right hand side at this point, it gets the tangent, and then it works of step size h in the direction of the tangent, and then this will be the x, x1 for the explicit Euler scheme. And well, you see this in this drawing, that's, that's not very accurate. 
of course, um, there are two things what, what one can do. One thing is um, making the step size smaller. So say this T one half, then, yeah, then there will be already a better solution. And this is also goes hand in hand with this consistency error. If this H gets smaller, then the error gets smaller. Um, but one can do other things, which are actually better. One can try to well, get a better approximation to to this to this ten to this um tangent here using more information, um yeah. And uh, so these are the two things that one can do to improve the accuracy of the schemes. And so this one thing was decrease h. Um, well, but this does not help typically too much. It, of course, it, it, it makes the error smaller. And if you look here at these formulas, so um, if you de decrease the, the h, then you get a smaller error according to this formula. But if you were able to make the p larger, then this effect will be much higher. Um, so these are the two things that you can do, decrease the h and use better phi h functions. So better schemes, more accurate schemes. And this means um, a higher consistency order. Um, well, to give you another interpretation on what this consistency error is and how this can be improved, um, we need another interpretation of this numerical scheme. And if you know the formulas for a solution to an ODE, you can write down this implicit formula saying that x of x of t is x of t0 plus t0, you start here and you go to to the actual t where you are and then here is f of tau x of tau t tau that's the the, the basic theorem of of uh, of analysis um yes so that that's a an exact formula for for the solution but of course it's implicit because the x is already here and you can use PK iteration um, well, to prove solutions of, of differential equations. You can use the PK scheme and this basis on this formula. And you can write this also down for, for just one step of the solution. So the, the, the actual solution at time t i plus 1 will be the actual solution at x of at, at the previous time step plus the, this integral from t i to t i plus 1. Now, if we <coughs> do quadrature for this integral, look at the implicit Euler, we will get, have that xi plus 1 is xi plus what we do is replacing this integral times h. So that, that's the length of the integral times a constant value. And for this constant value, we take f of ti plus 1 x i plus one. Um, well, what one? And maybe to give you this interpretation here, it's so easy. No, that's oh, oh, maybe not. <laughs> maybe we stick to this formula and this interpretation. We have to draw the the f here. That, that's not so easy to digest then. So um, maybe you can take this very abstract stand that if you have an integral from one over a time interval of a function, depending on time, you can, all right, let's, let's maybe make a small plot. So say this is time, here you have ti, here you have ti plus one, and here you have some function, g of t. Then you can, of course, compute the integral here as taking the length, the length of this integral, this is the h, times one value of this. So what 
what we will do is um, approximating the integral by, by this. This is the distance h and this value over here. Um, if you remember this numerical quadrature, there are of course much better, much better solutions to quadrature than just taking one value. And one is, for example, the, the midpoint rule. You know that if you would take like this value here, then you will have double, uh, no, you have second order approximation quality here. So you can also think of, of a scheme that xi plus one is xi plus, plus h of f at ti plus, so to say evaluating here in the middle, then, well, we don't know the x, but one can well, uh, interpolate this, for example, xi plus xi plus one over two. So this would be the middle point rule for such a, such a time integration scheme. And one already knows this is, this is order two. Um, in implicit Euler, we have just shown this is order one. And this middle implicit midpoint rule is order two. So just like using a better integration scheme, we have gained one order. And from this idea of approximating an integral and interpreting this as, as a numerical inter interpolation scheme, um, we can use a general quadrature rule. General quadrature rule. And I hope you remember your numeric course. This general quadrature rule has abscissas and weights. Um, these abscissas, we will denote them by gamma j. And the weights we will denote by theta j. Um, well, shall I write this down for you? Mm, yeah, maybe. Yet another color. Mm, yeah, I write this. So the integral from, from zero to one over g of t d t is approximated by j goes from one to s beta j. So these are the weights times g of, of this gamma j. And this is, if you go, if you compare it with this here, this means, well, taking some values of the function and giving them a proper weight and then this will resemble, this will approximate this integral very nicely up to a, up to a very high order. I think you have case these Gaussian collocation points, for example, which give you optimal order. And well, there are very nice formulas for that, so that one can inter and approximate these integrals by a quadrature. And well, this general quadrature rule comes with um, abscissas and weights. And then the idea is well, to use this quadrature on, on, on this integral that, to give, that defines the solution for us. And if we now put this into a scheme, so the xk plus one is again the xk, this here will be the x, oh no, sorry, xi plus one xi. Um, this will be, yeah, xi plus one xi here and here. And this will be the, <coughs> the length of the integral, the length of, of the time interval and well, and then the function evaluated at with respect to these these um, abscissas and weighted with the weights. So here we are, will have the beta j's, and here we will have the gamma j and the gamma j. This is how a time integration scheme can be derived from a general quadrature rule. This does not help too much by now because uh, no. <laughs> we, 
Oui, 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 oui. Let's go back, maybe one step. Um, so. Here we have x of ti plus 1 x of ti um, yeah. So that's what we had here x of ti plus 1 is x of ti and now we have but integrated uh, approximated the, the integral with this quadrature formula and this in particular means we don't have the equality here anymore but this is non approximation and now we want to turn this approximation into a definition for for these these values it is clear that um, so we can certainly we can certainly use the um, So this will be certainly will be the x k x i plus one. So this in our scheme, this will be the x i plus one. This here is what we know. That's the x i. But uh, most most importantly, here we have we we still have these values, and it's not clear what 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 this should be. Here is the actual solution. That, that's not exactly the xi, but that's also not the xi plus one. But this is something in between. And well, this will be also similar to that. It will be uh, intermediate values of the scheme. And since they depend on the i, that, that's like the time where you, we are right now, but also on the j. And the j depends, well, belongs, relates to the stage here. Um, well, this will be values that depend on x and i, and we will we will denote them by the by a large x. And this is x i j. And they are um well they should approximate this x t i at J H, so this x i j will be an approximation to that, and they are called the internal internal stage values. And, yeah. and if, if we have these x i j, then of course we can evaluate the f at that point. And so take another color for that so we can approximate all this um this is basically f of ti plus gamma j h and x i j this we will approximate by the so-called stage derivatives that is the x dot again a large x x i j they are called the stage derivatives it's not so much exactly a derivative that's why i better put this in here okay yeah, but but once more so we have this formula but we have this x at ti which is not defined yet um but this will be then parts of the scheme to define this x of, or approximate this x of the i gamma j h and the, the value that we denote by x i j and if we have this x i j we can well, define the stage derivatives because then <coughs> we can we can we can well, write down a scheme for that so how do we Battery charger. So the, the scheme will be mm, define the x i j, and we will define them as 
dxk. So this somehow makes sense that, that that's a solution somewhere in between. So it will certainly be related to this xk. And then, well, actually this will be like an intermediate integral in between. So here r1 as alpha alpha i l alpha i alpha i l x dot i l um yeah. and here you can think of this is like x k plus h times one times f of x k just think of that and that's how so in in a, in a very easy case where s is one and we only have one stage then this might look like that so here the stage derivatives they include the f uh, and here's a bit more advanced formula to defining these intermediate stage values um, also that's more or less just evaluating but of course it, this goes hand in hand that then x dot i l is f of t i plus J is dx. Oh, this, of course, is xi. Um, okay. xil is f of ti plus uh, gamma l plus gamma l h xil. This, this is this, this derivative here. And, well, and finally, oh, and once on this, this is a nonlinear. This is a possibly nonlinear system for the x i l oh. okay well you see it's better like that we can of course just write these x i l values directly in here then this will be a nonlinear system for for the xil values. A nonlinear implicit this may all happen for the for the xil. And once we have the xil, then well, we can so here we can insert them here and then we get the, the new iterate xi plus 1 is xi and then all this in here and this nonlinear system is defined through defined through um, coefficients coefficients Beta, basically defined through the gamma j, the, the gamma j, they, they come in here and here were these alpha and the alpha j l, okay, that's also wrong in here, j l x i l. 
Run through this alpha JL. Okay, and they define that the scheme. Depending on how this alpha and the, the gammas are chosen, we get different schemes, and then of course how this better in the end. And these are the famous, very famous Hungi Kutta schemes. That one likes to write in this form. Here we have the gamma one, gamma two, and gamma s. Here one has the beta one, and the beta s, and here one has this matrix curly A is the alpha J L. J goes from 1 to S and the L goes from 1 to S. Okay, in short, this is beta no, 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 this is gamma beta transposed and this the A matrix. On, well, one, one can go further and find that such a scheme is defined by gamma better and this A matrix and well, consistency, stability. Um, <clears throat> as induced, as induced by the coefficients. So other coefficients here in this alpha and the beta and the gamma scheme will define uh, different different approximations, and well, one has to check whether they this approximation is consistent and whether this is stable. And we will do this for DAs. But before, um, let me put down just this one set sentence. The proper choice of a beta and gamma ensures stability. And consistency. And uh, maybe we can end this section with a number of examples. Examples, maybe we start with this very easy scheme one, zero, zero. Um, well, how this would look like? It will look like um oh my nice colors this will look like x x k plus one is x k plus h times one times x dot K one okay, and this is this one, this one is this one. Um then we will have that that the X K one is here we have it X K one Okay, I will change this x i one two two two. I have given this this lecture too many times and always with a different 
always with a different notation, but I hope I can be consistent from now on. So the time index is always di. So xi plus 1 is xi, xi1. And we have xi1 dot is f of ti plus 0 times h of x i 1 and the other here this is this this gamma have more colors or this zero is this zero over here and now we have the, the stage values xij as the xi plus h here's the s ij um, so here we have xij as xi plus h there's no sum then we have the zero times x dot I one okay um, believe me or not but this zero here is this zero okay and then well typically one uh, one read would like would have to to solve all the system but uh, because of this many zeros in here we can try to write this down so this will give us that xij is just xi then we will have that so we'll go this way x dot ij is f of ti and xi xi xi1 xi xi1 and that's just the little xi okay on and the printed version it's easier to distinguish the, the small x small xi is also small xi and then we can have that xi plus 1 is xi plus h times f of ti xi. Okay, and that's explicit Euler scheme as we had it in this, this one example before. Now maybe uh, one one final bit more complicated example um, if we have a look at, at this tableau 0 0 0 1 half 1 half 0 0 and 1 what will this give us uh, xk plus 1 is xk plus h times 0 <laughs> sorry xi 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 plus 1 is xi Here we have the stage value xi1 plus 1 times xi2. The stage derivatives. What are these zeros here and the 1? So this was this one, 0, this is this 1. Here, this is, these are the, be the betas. And 
which will be finished and then we have like to define this stage derivative values uh, x i1 dot f, f of t i plus 0 so here it is this this will be here yeah, defining the, the first um the, the, the first <laughs> Stage derivative values so x i one s plus x i one in here and x without a dot i one and will be given as x k plus zero times. I one dot plus zero times x i two dot. So now we are here. This was the first here that that's the first line. This is this first gamma. And these are the, the alphas. Okay, and for the, the second stage value, we have that x dot i2 as f of ti plus a half. Um, plus a half h. And <coughs> We have a stage value, the second, and x i2 as x i, oh, this was for the last time, x i, x i plus a half, so this is this half, um, x dot 1 plus 0, x and two okay um another color for that so this was this half this is this half this half this half and this half okay now we can see whether we can resolve this scheme into one formula that that's often not possible but yeah for these easy cases, in particular for these explicit cases. I will make a comment on explicit in a second. Um, we can try this. So xi plus 1, from here we get xi1 as just the xi. Then no, we get the xi dot. And from here we get x i one dot f of t i x i. Okay. Um, okay. Here that we have as well. And then we have that x one x i two. As x i plus mm, no i forgot the h all the time h times h times h times h times okay here i have it so, um, plus <coughs> xi dot this one plus f of ti xi okay and so that's that's what we need we need actually we need oh no we need the dots here okay <laughs> and then we can come from here to say that x1 dot 2 f of ti plus half h and this one 
xi plus a half h f of ti xi. Okay, and uh, with all that together, basically with this part, you can have a look here to see that xi plus 1 is xi plus h times xi dot 2, so this one, and this is this, h times f ti plus h half plus xi plus a half f of ti xi. And that's the so-called improved Euler. Okay, and then well, we will stop the lecture in a second. I just want to make a few final comments. Um, final remarks. One thing that one should like have in mind and I will make a little coding exercise where you will see what, what's the problem there. So one step methods depend on the rounding error epsilon like O of epsilon over h. So yeah, so there there is an error term, an error part of the error where you have one over h in there. It's still multiplied by the by the rounding error, so it might be very small. But if h gets really small, then you will see this term. And then so practically. Good accuracy. Accuracy only with higher order methods. Higher order methods and typically you use P equal maybe four, five or six. But I must say that I only use P equal to two in my codes because there are some, still some very easy to implement schemes. But I guess if you want to do this professionally, you should start with four, five, or six. Okay, and implicit scheme if and only if this A matrix invertible. This will be important for the DAEs. All right, so much for today. Again, oh, <laughs> it's really a long lecture, but uh, that, that's all for this week, except from, from a little coding exercise that I will provide. But yeah, thanks for staying with me, and I hope we, we, will, we will have fun applying this to DAEs. Bye-bye.